so excited and happy to be talking to you all today uh, at the invitation of the wondrous fall for the book and Ellen Elliott. And you all, some of you may already know me through my books under Water and Sky or Hamilton and Peggy, uh, Suspect Red uh, or Give Me Liberty. Today I'm going to talk to you about my new book, Storm Dog, uh, which is a little different for me. It's not historical. It's contemporary, told in first person through this a uh, whip-smart, slightly sassy 14-year-old girl named Ariel, who's a bit of a misfit, uh, and through the course of the novel is trying to find herself and her self-definition and kind of a sense of belonging. And she does that through nature, uh, music, her own creativity and imagination, a friendship with an Afghanistan war veteran, a lost dog who finds her in a storm. Uh, dog dancing, which is a thing, which I'll tell you more about, and the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival Parade. Uh, it's a little whimsical. Uh, sometimes I think it might even be a little bit outrageous in humor. Uh, my children have told me that in tone they feel like it's a combination of dumpling and because of Miss, uh, because of Win Dixie. And if that's true, what a great compliment. Here's the prelude, and this is Ariel speaking to y'all. I was born in tempest season, in the month of March, when the world has trouble deciding what season it wants to be. Round here in Virginia, that means temperatures can swing 30 degrees in a single day. We duck and cover through freak hailstorms and wild downpours that explode into being all of a sudden, when a hopeful spring breeze stumbles up against leftover winter air that's curled up comfortable and happy against the Blue Ridge Mountains. I swear it makes the cold air mad. Bam! There's pushback, lightning and thunder, swirling clouds and gales that blow your hair every which way, like the ears of a dog hanging out the window of a car racing along Route 50. Snowflakes can mingle in tiny cyclones with pink blossoms that winds tear off the branches of flailing fruit trees. Creeks rage into tidal waves of brown, terrified water that can knock down high banks of spring bluebells that had just started to rejoice into life. The world is all cacophony, aggravation, and I can't figure out what I'm thinking tantrums. Sort of the way I feel all the time. According to my family, I've always been like that, coming into the world during one of those March weather ragers, thrashing and crying, a seismic so surge of sound and sass and questions. Mama calls me the storm child, and she doesn't mean it in a nice way. Maybe that's why she doesn't like me. Too much noise, too much angst, just too much. I suppose I get her point. I can't remember a time that winds and waves weren't turning me up inside, but I just don't see the point in being all calm and cool about things. It seems like a whole lot of boring still pond water to me, no matter how beautiful those glassy reflections are. That's the way my sister is, smooth, polished to an appealing sheen of perfect pretty. Nothing disquieting or, or annoying about her, in public anyway. Everyone says to me, why can't you be more like Gloria? Gloria would never break the window. That was a total accident, by the way. I just heard about David and Goliath in Sunday school and was testing out whether a slingshot and stone could really take down a giant. I wasn't aiming for Gloria's window, I swear. Gloria would never kick a hole in a door. My arms were full of books and nobody would open that stupid door for me. Gloria would never walk around with ketchup stains on her shorts. Honestly, when I eat with my family, things just seem to jump out of my hands. Gloria would never pout about a lovely pink ribbon being put in her hair. It was the size of a baseball mitt, okay? Gloria won the Miss Apple Blossom Outstanding Teen Contest when she was 15. During high school, she starred in all the plays that featured a blonde Barbie doll type character. People started talking about how she was sure to be discovered one day, like Marilyn Monroe was when a photographer just happened to walk into the munitions factory where she was working the assembly line and spotted her. Child, you are the spitting image of her, the church ladies would coo at Gloria on Sundays. Now, Gloria is 19 years old, and there's a chance she'll be chosen as one of the Shenandoah Festival princesses for this year's parade. If that happens, Gloria will be really famous around here, just from sitting and smiling, waving that cuffed hand, homecoming queen salute, and floating down Washington Street on a cart, um, on a cart decorated with sheets of plastic flowers. I can hear all the church ladies. When those Hollywood scouts see her in the parade, they'll snap Gloria up. She is going places for sure. 
Then they'll probably turn to me and say the type of thing that tossed at me when I snitched cookies from the rectory hall before the service, knocking over pitchers of apple juice, of course, onto the church's tablecloth in the process. Try to be a little bit more like your sister, Ariel. If you don't settle down, the rapture may pass you over and leave you with H-E double hockey sticks. That's hell, in case you don't speak church lady. Yep, that's me, the storm child. Sometimes I worry they may be right, though. When squalls roll up, spilling zigzag blue-black shadows across our pastures, ripping up trees and toppling them onto power lines to make sparks fly, it does seem like the devil is trying to take over God's good work. And I kind of like listening to the winds and watching lightning crackle across the skies like gigantic electrified snakes. But here's the honest truth. I like the afterward just as much. I love that miracle when a peephole of sunlight breaks through all those angry clouds and then spreads slowly, dissolving the dark into a luminous heavenly blue. You can smell the earth greening up. And the singing of birds when they've ventured out from their hunkered down hiding spots, singing in joy, being saved from annihilation. Well, they sound like a chorus of angels to me. I wish people could see that I'd really rather not go to H-E double hockey sticks because when everyone expects you to become a screw up, it's hard to avoid becoming one. Almost like I'd disappoint them if I turned out well. I suspect that's what led me to my trouble. Although I have to admit the idea did just come to me. Nobody told me to do it. It all began after one of those wild cymbal crashing March thunderstorms that took out a bunch of trees just for fun during the night. That and a phone call during breakfast. That's the prelude. Okay, so let's talk about where those ideas come from. Now you should know back in Virginia, there is this magical person with fall for the book who is going to be putting up slides for you to look at while I'm talking about, okay? So here we're on slide one. Let's talk about where ideas come from. Uh, I hope it's proof that once you know how to write, um, how to report and research a story, that you can write many genres and on many topics. And that's part of the real joy of writing for me. I'm constantly learning. So I can write about the Revolutionary War, uh, World War II, uh, the 1950s, 1960s, and something contemporary like Storm Dog. Um, by the way, I call myself an accidental novelist. I was a Washington uh, Magazine journalist for almost for 20 years before taking a sidestep, what I thought was going to be a sidestep, into writing fiction, um, where I fictionalized and expanded one of my stories that had been about my dad's experiences as a World War II bomber, um, bomber pilot during, um, during World War II over France, uh, which you all may know as Under a War Torn Sky. Um, while I was at the Washingtonian, I covered women's issues, health and the arts, and I did these really long, like 5,000 word narratives, sort of a month in the life of um, features uh, that was written in scenes and dialogue. Uh, so what your teachers may actually call these days creative, uh, creative nonfiction. Um, those years as a reporter really taught me how to spot a story begging to be told. Um, to report it with revealing details and scenes, and um, to always try to take a new tact on a subject. Um, that served me really well with Storm Dog. Um, so if you want to be a writer as a grown-up, please write for your school paper. It's great training. Um, these are two of my favorite New Yorker covers to take with me when I come and talk to you all. Left, uh, that's uh, you see the angst and the eureka of finding ideas. By the way, that's a typewriter, you guys, for those of y'all who don't know. Um, on the right uh, is a gentleman writing himself into that proverbial corner with no place to go except out the window. That's what happens to you when you don't have an outline of some sort. And yes, teachers told me to say that to you guys, but it's true. Just talking in general about traits that kind of help you be a good writer or to be able to capture a story well when you do want to write, stop talking and listen. Um, have your antenna up at all times. Be self-disciplined. Uh, set goals, stick to them. Um, plan ahead. Don't wait until the last minute. I promise you, if you try to write something the night before it's due, you're going to freeze. Um, read, 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 read all the time. Um, interview and talk with interesting people. They're going to have great stories to tell you. Absorb them. Listen. And then kind of mull over what the meaning is of them. Find the parable in them. A parable is kind of the lesson, what you can learn, the themes 
of a story. We'll talk about that more in a minute. I want to know your most inner thoughts. I want to know how you feel about things. I want to know how things affected you. But you are really a writer when you can do that, but also stand in the shoes of someone else. And imagine what they're feeling and what they're thinking, given their reactions, how life might be affecting them. Um, practice, keep a journal, write to the school paper if you can. Write down snippets of descriptions and scenes and conversations. Watch people and how they react to things. I don't want to tell you to be an eavesdropper, but you know, go someplace where you can watch people pass by and think about, hmm, I wonder why they're looking angsty today. Um, if you can, one of the great things about being a journalist is listening to people talk and trying to write it down verbatim exactly the way they say it because dialogue may be the best character reveal of all. Again, we'll talk about that more later. When you're trying to come up with ideas, brainstorm. Keep writing your note, keep notes about what you've come up with because sometimes what happens is you think of something fabulous and then you can't remember the, it the next day. So write it down. Um, be a detective, y'all. Um, uh, to me, the best part of writing is doing the research and the reporting because that's where I'm getting, that's the treasure hunt. That's where you find all these incredible details. Um, the, uh, to me, that's the best. So research it, report it. Uh, then think a little bit about the how come of a story. One of my characters in Flying South, which is a little like uh, Storm Dog in terms of the first person narrative, although it is historical, is um, Alice is constantly saying, how come, how come? asking me how come questions. How come we act that way? How come that person did that? Why didn't he try this instead? It's one of the real glories of being a writer. You get to ask those kinds of questions about why we do what we do. Um, before you start writing, think about uh, the questions that you want your story to explore, right? Kind of what challenges to conventional thinking? What, um, what is your protagonist going to be facing? And then try to think about what character, anecdote, or scene can illustrate, can show, rather than tell those things. Uh, and like I said before, look for a new angle or viewpoint, like talking about coming of age um, and a tale of self-discovery through dog dancing. I'm gonna follow my own advice now and show you what I mean with some examples of my writing from whence my ideas came. So, slide six, number one, personal experiences. Now, y'all, we're living in difficult times and I'm so sorry that you are not able to be together in school, most of you right now, and might not be with your teammates or your choruses or your bands. It's little recompense, and I would never throw that really dumb line at you about, you know, make lemonade out of lemons, because this has been a terrible and difficult time for everyone, and especially y'all. Um, but it is a truth that, you know, times of crises, when we have to really pull down deep and find the inner steel within us, for writers can produce a really compelling story. Um, and I would like to hear what you're thinking and feeling during this time. You know, that's, those are good stories to tell, okay? And to share with one another. Um, now, the screen, what you see on the screen is a, um, a, it's a watercolor of a 1772 hurricane. Lin-Manuel Miranda, for those of you, and I'm sure most of you do, know the miraculous and truly brilliant musical Hamilton that Miranda um, created for us. He took this, um, you know, really perplexing, incredibly inspiring, but, you know, complicated man and found parable and meaning in his life and gave that to us in his musical. But the whole basis and beginning of that, of Alexander Hamilton's being and being important to us as a founding father and a patriot was the fact that he wrote about surviving a hurricane. His essay about that, um, devastate, about the hurricane devastating St. Croix, is like I said, such a striking example of somebody kind of like completely changing his life, his or her life, through choosing to write. Um, that impoverished, essentially orphaned 17-year-old who you know, picked up his pen and wrote everything down as far as he could see and wrote his own deliverance. Um, the piece was, as I'm sure you know, published in the St. Croix newspaper and the fellow islanders of his were so impressed by his eloquence that they took a collection to send him to the mainland, which is where he came to us. I bring him up because another method of, of getting um, your ideas is on assignment. And uh, like your teacher giving you a writing prompt, my brilliant editor at HarperCollins, 
um, Collins, Catherine Teagan. She also edited the series Divergent, which I'm sure most of you all know. It really has an astute sense of what the public is interested in and wants to know a lot about. And she knew that I had just taken my daughter, who is a theater, uh, theater artist, a director in Washington, D.C., to see the musical because she needed, as a director, to see this shift in the paradigm of everything that is possible now in theater, thanks to Miranda. Um, and we were able to see it before it became impossible to get tickets, and we're just stunned and besotted with it, of course. And Catherine said to me, why don't you write something about Hamilton, since that was such a great experience for you? Now, uh, I immediately thought of Peggy as an old reporter, you know, who, who uh, bounces into the Skylar Sister song with that one, for, that tantalizing, and Peggy, um, and then she kind of, you know, she disappears in the second act. Um, and it doubles, the actress doubles as another character. By my count, she only had 36 solo words in the musical, and she just felt like a story waiting in the wings to be told. Um, and that's, you know, like I said, that's something I learned as a reporter, looking for a hole in the coverage, something other writers are ignoring. I mean, there are all these wonderful books about Eliza, who is so fascinating, um, and Hamilton had already been done and was sacrosanct as far as I was concerned, so I didn't want to touch him. But uh, um, Peggy ended up being this really fascinating real-life person, which I'll tell you more, I'll tell you more about her in a minute. Anyway, so that leads me to my a third way of finding an idea is to find a hole in coverage, right? Something that hasn't really been covered or written about um, enough or hasn't been overwhelmed with things that have been written about in the past. Journalism really teaches you to do that. Now, I spend a lot of time in schools, which is a great privilege for me, uh, talking to you all. And I knew that while you often read Fahrenheit 451 or the play The Crucible, that you might not have the time within your social studies to study the time period in which those works were written. Both of these important works um, were born in and reflect and comment on the 1950s Red Scare and McCarthyism, a time when books were banned, librarians were fired if they didn't pull those things, uh, those particular books off their shelves, um, people were blacklisted from jobs, um, all for expressing opinions that were deemed subversive things like believing in civil rights or protective labor laws and unions or equal justice. These ideas, sometimes these people will be smeared as being un-American and hauled in front of loyalty review boards, um, suspected of being disloyal. And even the book Robin Hood was banned because he took from the rich and gave to the poor and a, an Indiana textbook commissioner decided that that was a communist philosophy and would um, you know, poison the minds of young people reading the books. That was cool. So I wrote um, Suspect Red using all those things and was able to really kind of look at the trickle down impact of a political leader's hate language and rhetoric on two teenage boys um, from different sides of the political spectrum and their friendship. Um, it explores the importance of thinking for oneself uh, not delving into mom mentality, of ex not accepting innuendo and rumor as fact. Um, so, and that was all from just kind of recognizing that there wasn't really a historical novel set in that time. I hope it provides you all um, meaningful discussion about media literacy and the importance of um, participating in democracy and thinking for yourself. The other way of finding a really good uh, topic is to dramatize a historical event or anecdotes that you've heard from family members or neighbors or you know friends at church um, that have moved you. You're humanizing the facts of history, which is what I hope I did with Under War Twin Sky. I'll just throw a statistic at you guys, um, which is the great thing about historical fiction. It can humanize those statistics that you have to memorize for your SOLs. Um, there, the British, uh, during World War II, um, thousands of American and British air crew members had to bail out of burning planes um, over Nazi-occupied France. 4,000 of those boys survived um, because specifically of the French and the Dutch resistance. But the British SOE, which was like their Secret Service CIA at the time, estimates that for each one of those British and American boys, that's my daddy, who survived, one French person died. So one for one. Could be a boring number, but let's stand in the shoes of this French person who um, chose to save this lost boy's 
life. Under Water and Sky, I hope um, really does that. I exist, more importantly, my babies exist because of some French teenagers your age or a little bit older who helped save my dad's life. Now let's go back to Stormdog, um, which I hope is a prime example of a fifth source for ideas, which is spotting story, which is honestly just seeing something and thinking, whoa, what is that about? I want to learn more about that. That sounds like a story. Um, this means that you have to be watching life and have those antenna up like I talked about before y'all um, Because life will drop gems in front of you, but you have to be paying attention um, I wasn't looking for a story idea when I just happened to open up in National Geographic and see this really interesting article about the, the healing powers and magic of, of dance um, And within that essay was one photo of a woman who was pirouetting with her golden retriever um, and doing musical freestyle and I thought what? What's that? That's fascinating. So now in my magazine days, I would have found a dog trainer and his or her dog, followed them through creating um, a, a, a routine and then on to a competition at a dog show, which would have been really interesting. But with a novel, I get to incorporate more. I can use symbols and themes and metaphors that expand the parable of that life experience of the dog trainer and the dog. And I can add in subplots and minor characters who could serve as foils. So let's talk about where those ideas came to, those symbols and those themes for me, where I found them for Stormdog. I should give you a quick overview of what comes after the prologue I've read you. Ariel sitting in a kitchen, phone rings. Um, we learn that her brother is um, the one person who kind of gets her, but he's in Afghanistan fighting. Um, her daddy isn't quite the same ever since George, her big brother, deployed. Um, her mother is completely and utterly obsessed and focused on her beautiful older sister, Gloria. Phone rings, and Gloria does indeed become chosen as a princess for the parade. Um, there's all this celebration that does not include Ariel and feeling like such an outsider, she takes to the hills. And there she's caught in this kind of sudden storm um, where a dog finds her. And amid all that kind of soul rattling, thunder and lightning, the dog leads her to the safety of a cabin and to meet Sergeant Josie, um, who's a former canine handler with the army. And throughout the course of the novel, together those three find themselves um, through uh, dog dancing and, uh, and kind of the storm child crazy idea of crashing the parade. Don't want to tell you any more. I hope you'll read the novel. Um, now, one of the best pieces of advice that my editor, the Washingtonian, gave me was to always remember that if someone is reading, he or she is thinking. And to not insult that reader by telling them what they should be thinking about this particular bit of information I just gave you. So forgive my doing it here in conversation. Um, in the book, these things just exist for you to note and to think about if you wish. Um, but since we're talking writing craft, let me explain a few of them to you storms. There are several of them um, during the book. They are definitely a metaphor for Ariel's internal upheavals and storms um, and winds and you know conundrums and how she's feeling about herself. Storms throw things out of whack. They make you focus on what's really important to you and storms can lead to revelation and redefinition just as you know massive downpours can um, you know wash away you know, dirt and weeds and things like that and produce kind of a clearing, um, that heavenly blue. Dog dancing, uh, it's great fun, looks like. It's kind of quirky, but it, and as such, it provides this really powerful symbol, I think, of self-expression and individuality, finding your own voice um, and artistic partnership, right, between the trainer and the dog. Uh, the parade itself, offers um, kind of an interesting standard definition of beauty that we can question a little bit through Ariel, I think. If someone's a jerk, um, is he or she really beautiful? There's a wonderful quote from Shakespeare that says, beauty lives with kindness, that I really like. Finally, the cat bird um, represents the importance of inner beauty. Uh, Ariel calls the cat bird the, the uh, jazz singers of birds. And she says, quote, you'd completely miss that dull looking, all gray cat bird's improvisational magic if all you thought about was his appearance. Okay, know your topic. 
All right, now don't let this scare you. Um, for historical fiction, fiction, I really need to become kind of a mini expert. I really need to immerse myself in the lingo, the clothes, the even the weather, the social conventions, all those things um, to make it authentic and palpable and um, plausible. Now for Peggy, uh, Hamilton and Peggy, I read all those books that you see there, skim them or outline them. That's 87 of them. Now you don't have to always do that, but that's what I do. Uh, with Storm Dog, even though it was contemporary, I still needed to report it. I still needed to watch a lot of dog dancing routines on YouTube and to go to the parade and just climb the hills at Sky Meadows um, again. Because y'all, ideas that are formed totally in the hy hypothetical without doing that kind of research are thin and lukewarm. So, you know, you really need to know what you're writing about. There are lots of ways to do this. You can, you can do all that reading or you can tap sources. Um, uh, librarians and historians, y'all, are a writer's best friend. I promise you, I would not have been able to write Hamilton and Peggy without um, the historical interpreters at Schuyler Mansion, the librarians at the George Washington Library at Mount Vernon, um, or the National Park Rangers at Morristown. They gave me access to all these really wonderful, you know, uh, un unpublished um, first person letters and memoirs, things that were really gripping. And they even helped me confirm and name a spy for um, General Schuyler, who may have really saved us from the um, British invasion from Canada. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to my website. I have a videotape there, and I hope maybe you'll read Hamilton and Peggy. Um, so ask the help of these experts. Or what you can do is you can interview people who have lived through an experience, or um, you know have you know a family member who did. Now. I'm gonna give you a crash course here on interviewing techniques. Be prepared, you guys. Do not go beforehand without having done some you know, background reading. Um, have a recording device and a pencil and paper pad, uh, paper with you all, with, with you because your recording device may die. The other thing that it does for you is that you can keep writing while your recording device is going and you won't um, disrupt the conversation or alarm your subject by suddenly going, Oh my goodness, that was interesting. You just said, I'm going to write that down right now um, because it'll stop the conversation. The other thing it lets you do is you write down all sorts of details while they're talking about what they're wearing, how they talk, what they, you know, all that background, wonderful, revealing details. Um, before you leave, always ask, is there something I should have asked that I didn't, that you would like to share with me? Be sure to thank them, y'all. And uh, don't be afraid to circle back and follow up with questions. Now, if you interview somebody and you're using them as a primary source, you have to be accurate and fair um, to what they've told you. And also, look to your own experiences. Nothing is wasted in a writer's life if you are paying attention. You're always saving strength, which are little bits and pieces of scenes or that person's personality quirks or a little bit of dialogue or an idea that came to you while you were watching something else. These are all little threads that are you know, tucked into your proverbial pocket to pull out later when you want to write something and you make a beautiful ball of twine with which to weave your story. So let's look at the things, these strings from my life um, that I use in Stormblog. Uh, the healing power of loving a dog. Now, I grew up on what had been my grandfather's dairy farm and I didn't have a whole lot of neighbors. So my dogs really became my comrades and my confidants. And, and there's a blog on my webpage if you wanna hear more about my various dogs. Music was my first and perhaps my most pervasive love. I once dreamed of becoming a concert flautist or a symphony orchestra conductor. Uh, I so believe in music's magic to elevate us. As Ariel says, music will uh, set Duke free and elevate her out of nobodyhood. Her brother George says that music is an outcry of the soul. And he quotes Thoreau, um, when I hear music, I fear no danger. I am invulnerable. In high school, I played piccolo and marched in the Shenandoah Apple Blossom Festival Parade with my high school band. In college, I was field conductor of Wake Forest University's marching band. So I know from firsthand experience that honestly, for sheer showmanship and camaraderie and just plain old musical fun, uh, nothing beats being in a really good high school marching band. I have a blog about that too if you want to read it. For your musicians out there, I am really sorry that you're, I'm, I know you're missing playing with your bands right now. Um, and 
I know that when you finally get to get back together that your music is going to carry a really special joy for you. For right now, keep on playing. There's a beauty and a uh, uh, fulfillment that comes in solo playing too. Um, so revel in that for now while you can and then just have a great time when you all are back together. Um, two of my favorite minor characters in Storm Dog embody all of my love of music. Ariel's big brother George, um, who is honestly the coolest of the cool. He is a high school drum major and a saxophone player. And the father of um, Gloria's discarded beau, Marcus. His father is this piccolo-toting, Herculean-sized, revolutionary war reenactor who comes to Ariel's rescue and um, mesmerizes a pack of pooches with, you know, playing a great tune on a piccolo. Uh, dog dancing? I never taught a dog to dance myself, um, although all my dogs have been rescued and I have gone through the process of getting them to trust a human being again. So, you know, I can definitely um, empathize with what Ariel needs to do for Duke. Um, but it was through my daughter uh, that I really witnessed a rather extraordinary creative partnership that can exist between a person and his or her pet or animal. She is a champion equestrian. Um, she was a, an eventer, which is a competition which includes three parts, cross country, stadium jumping, and dressage. And in her pony club days, I was always trailering her to rallies, including the dressage rally, where I witnessed um, musical freestyle dressage, which is really quite beautiful. Go to my website, you can see some film clips of it. I got to watch these young women, who I knew through my daughter, uh, coaxing these 1,200 pound horses into sashaying and dancing and turning um, to music. Uh, that they, you know, in a, in a routine that they had created and practiced over and over again. And I got to marvel at that creativity's magic and beauty, but also see the delight and sense of accomplishment that these young women had at knowing how to befriend and understand and work with an animal, a, a horse for them, um, to create these rather astounding displays of symbiosis between the two of them. So I could transpose that to Ariel and her dog. Setting can be really important, and it definitely was um, for the world of Storm Dog. Nature, and specifically Sky Meadows State Park, is where Ariel goes to escape her troubles, to have a hawk's cloud down perspective on the world um, from those vistas that are up on those hills, and where she can find the ethereal and sense of divine, however it is that you all define that. For her, um, she finds it in a catbird song or the exquisitely delicately etched face of a tiny spring beauty uh, wildflower. Um, Sky Meadows Park, y'all, is only an hour's drive west of Tyson's Corner and I hope you can go and see it someday. It's gorgeous. Go walk those trails and feel the winds that kiss the earth up there if you can. Setting can also set up the conundrums and the conundrums of problems that will be facing your uh, protagonist. You know, it's interesting, the geographic setting of Storm Dog, where I've grown up, and I've spent my most of, except for college, spent my life in this area. So I've watched it change. I've known all of its elements all my life. Um, there's a really fascinating kind of push-pull between disparate and neighboring cultures and philosophies in Ariel's world. You know, conservative, liberal, city, suburbs, suburbs, country, and the poison of stereotypical expectations and xenophobia um, within a 70 mile radius, you know, 75 mile square miles of Ariel's world in this northwest corner of Virginia, um, you will find elbowing one another, some of these pictures that I have there, 19th century country estates and equestrians who still ride to the hounds chasing foxes um, with designer boutique luxury shopping meccas uh, million dollar plus track homes and family um, working farms and orchards that are still being that um, that are picked by migrant workers and immigrants and lots and lots of people who are kind of barely scraping by um, the area kind of bubbles with frictions and prejudices and misunderstandings between all these very different people because of stereotypes expectations um, and it was really important to me when I, and, uh, that I, when I realized that my characters could 
deal with and resolve some of these differences and misconceptions through personal exchanges and actually coming to know one another. Details make a story rich and full, and they can also be, you know, that's the character reveals, right? At the Washingtonian Magazine, I was often inside these kind of large generic topics that I then had to find in every man, one person who embodied all the challenges and fears and hopes and longings within that situation. It's humanizing um, an issue. Um, someone, uh, a reader could walk the journey with and feel it emotionally, um, giving emotional resonance to facts makes the, those facts really um, real. <laughs> um, so I had been asked to do a story about uh, breast cancer treatments and I found this really lovely young mother, you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, um, who had to go undergo one of the first bone marrow transplants at Fairfax Hospital and she would need to be quarantined for two weeks as she recovered. Now I could have told you that she was this extraordinary thoughtful mother. But what I did instead was I witnessed and um, painted the scene of her picking out 13 different outfits, shorts and tops and little matching socks to pin together and hang up in her daughter's closet. So her daughter wouldn't have to you know, think of that while she was gone and kind of feel her mother's presence um, as she got dressed in the morning. And here's another example that I'll just go back to Hamilton and Peggy. Um, with Peggy Schuyler, Nothing existed in her own hand during the American Revolution, so I, I had to research her through other people and people who knew her. Um, and Hamilton's letters proved to be this incredible motherload of gold about Peggy, um, who he called instantly Sprightly Peggy or My Little Sister, and he dropped all this gossip about her in his letters to Eliza. Um, within days of meeting Eliza, Hamilton actually writes Peggy, um, saying he had already formed a more than common partiality for her person and mind because of a miniature portrait that Eliza has painted and carries with her of Peggy. Hamilton playfully begs Peggy as a nymph of equal sway to please come to Morristown to distract the other aides to camp from Eliza so that he can monopolize Eliza to himself. Now I wish I had time to share that letter because it gives you a taste of the real delight of primary documents, the sense of someone from long ago sitting down right beside you and whispering into your ear all their hopes and longings and fears and with Hamilton, this braggadocio um, and kind of bad boy shtick and vulnerability. He's really vulnerable and sweet in those letters. Um, you can find them on my website. Um, but basically for right now, just know that Hamilton is basically asking Peggy to be his wingman in his courtship of Eliza. Now, here's the big reveal. Upon receiving that letter, Peggy seems to have ridden out into the absolute worst winter ever recorded in American history. There were 28 nor'easters that started recorded from November 1st through April 1st. At the time she rides out, there were six foot high snow drifts and the temperatures were so cold that the New York Harbor had frozen solid enough for cannon to be pulled across it. She has to ride 150 miles through enemy occupied territory where I promise you, um, loyalists would have been thrilled to capture a General Schuyler daughter and to hold her for ransom. So she could have been captured. She could have been lost in a blizzard or she could have frozen to death on the way, but she goes for the love of her sister. I think to kind of check out, you know, who's this rogue who, who's writing her. What does it tell you about her? She was bodacious. Uh, another example, if you all have read Under a War-Torn Sky, I just, I could, I could have told you that in those rattletrap bombers, um, those boys could have been in 30 degree below zero temperatures. And I could just say that to you, or I could get them dressed to go on a mission, which is what I do. In the picture you'll see there, they're all bundled up in all those fleece lined um, leather, bomber jackets but underneath that they had to put on the first thing they put on were blue long john underwear that was wired like electric blankets that they would have to plug into the electrical circuitry of the plane now it boys y'all tend to laugh when i say that that it, somebody's plugging their underwear into the electrical circuitry of the plane but here's the harsh reality about that Daddy always told me how much he hated wearing those things because if flak, if you all know what flak is, which is boiling hot, exploding metal, like grenades and small bombs that were thrown up into the air to try to take these planes down um, from the Nazis on the ground. Um, if flak exploded and a bit of shrapnel hit the end of the wing, there would be an electrical surge that would go through the plane and up the wires into your underwear. And my dad actually had 
uh, scars from singe marks from that happening. Now, it's not like it would electrocute you, and it's not like it's a burn like you're putting your hand in fire, but it, it hurt. Um, but they had to wear that or they could get frostbite or hypothermia. The other thing that they had to do, Daddy, uh, as a co-pilot, had to remember in the middle of a battle, in the middle of dropping bombs, in the middle of being, you know, buzzed by Messerschmitts, every 20 minutes to watch his watch and to say, crack down your lines, boys, because they're, um, it was so cold that they're, you know, if they're shouting and they're scared and they're perspiring, their masks, their oxygen masks, there'd be spit coming out it could freeze and could block the airflow, which can make them pass out in the middle of a battle. So you have to crack down your lines, boys, to break up the ice, okay? That's a revealing detail. With Stormdog, I wanna talk a little bit about what a great character reveal dialogue is. Um, Sergeant Josie is suffering PTSD, um, and I show her reacting to the storm's thunder and lightning flashes with real fear um, to show you. Um, with Gloria's boyfriend, Marcus, who actually is a wonderful contradiction of traits, and one of my favorite characters in many ways, um, someone who people might dismiss as a stereotypical hick, you know, if you don't take the time to know him. Um, they'd miss out on what an idealistic and smart and wise young man he is. I reveal those things with little brushstrokes like books that are in the back of his car, tossed in the car seat, devotionals for deer hunters, for instance, right next to a book he's reading, don't know much about history, everything you need to know about American history, and they're lying on top of a pizza outfit that he has to wear for a part-time job that he's working to try to save money to go to community, community college. Um, a lot of his reveals come through his word choice and his colloquialisms. He's quoting both scriptures and scripture and um, Roman philosophers. Um, one of the uh, Mark Twain actually said, "Don't say the old lady screamed. Bring her on and let her scream," which is really true. Um, one of my personal writing heroes is Anna Quinlan. She was a Newsweek columnist, a turned novelist, and she says. Uh, I spent decades writing down people's words verbatim, how real people talk. I learned that syntax and rhythm were almost as individualistic as a fingerprint. That one quotation, per precisely transcribed and, and intentionally untidied, could delineate a character in a way that pages of exposition never could. It's definitely true with Marcus. You get a lot of him when he says to Ariel, think because I live in a trailer park and you uh, and not some old fancy house like yours that I can't have good manners. With Ariel, her voice too is slightly edgy, it's hurt but hopeful, it's awestruck and uh, idealistic about the beauty and nature. At the same time, she can throw some substantial shade about her peers. Those are all good character reveals. Now you're ready. Here's what you need to do. Sit down and write. Don't get stuck, do it. Don't get stuck on that first page, keep going and then go back. Don't try to perfect it. I hope you all have all thrown a clay pot at some point during your art classes so you know that it takes a lot of different steps to perfect it. Um, less is more. Um, Twain says, you know, as for the adjective, when in doubt, throw it out. Uh, Self-edit, one of the things that I do is I always read what I've written to myself because, you know, language has a musicality and a rhythm and a pacing and if I stumble over my words as I read them out loud, I need to tweak it and clean it up. Um, take input from an editor, whether that's your teacher or a librarian or your parents or your best friend, somebody who you trust. Um, and then listen to what they've told you. Um, you know, make revisions that you agree with and really absorb what they've told you. And remember, please, time is your friend. Don't do this stuff at the last minute, y'all. Because if you take a, a, even a day of not working on something and then go back and read it with you know, fresh eyes, you're going to find things that you're going to want to clean up. I remember a pretty crusty newspaper guy uh, talking to me at my first job saying, eh, don't worry about it. As soon as you find your lead, the rest will write itself. Now, it's not as simple as that, but there is a truth in the fact that if you get a really good opener, something that grabs the reader and encapsulates what you're trying to do with your book, um, the rest will be easier to write. You get a really good lead. Um, with Under a War-Torn Sky, it was Henry having a terrible nightmare about a mis mission that's gone really, really bad. With Peggy, it was that letter. With Suspect Red, I start with uh, Richard reading uh, Robin Hood and his mother freaking out about it and taking it away from him because she's afraid um, of being, you know, of her husband's job being harmed by the fact that they might be reading subversive books at home. Um, with Storm Dog, 
I start with the prologue so that you can really be in Ariel's, and the prelude, sorry, you can really be in Ariel's head from the get-go. Um, and that first person voice really allowed me to play at both the offbeat and the sassy and philosophical in Ariel's personality and story. Um, there's a lot of character plot and reveals in it. Um, I hope you, you know, you figure out that Mama and Gloria are going to be antagonists. There's a hurtful, you know, prejudgments of her that she's fighting um, and that there's big trouble coming for her. Uh, and it ends with a little bit of a cliffhanger, which also, if you all can do, try to because it makes people go, uh, you know, oh, what? A uh, phone call. I'm going to turn the page and go to the next. Uh, just a little bit of uh, reassurance to, for you all. Don't panic about any of this. Try to think of writing as being like a drip sandcastle. I hope you all have done that at some point in your in your life where you just stick your hands into that wet um, sand and just go drip, 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 and build a sandcastle like the one pictured. If you've done your research, if you've thought about what you want to write, if you've done a little bit of planning, I promise you, you're just going to build a sandcastle. It's drip, drip, detail upon detail, builds a sentence of, you know, paragraph, page, chapter, book, no sweat. Um, remember that gentleman who is writing himself into a corner? That is what happens to you if you don't have an outline. But it can be simple. Know your beginning and your ending, and you'll find your way, the stepping stones in between. If, you're, if you start with that great opener and you know you're trying to make it to here, what gets you there? You're not going to get as lost. Okay? I'm going to leave you now to work through uh, the next four slides on your own or with your teacher or with those amazing substitute teachers in your life right now, your parents or your siblings or your grandparents, you know, the people in your family who are kind of helping you do schooling at home now um, during COVID. Um, so, and please take your time with each photo. These are from World War II and some and incredibly powerful images. I tend to bring them with me when I'm leading creative writing um, workshops. Um, I want you to take your time look at them, absorb them, analyze what's going on there, and then try to imagine with those amazing brains of yours um, what you're going to write. And I promise you, you're going to discover how incredibly imaginative and creative and what good storytellers you are. Uh, the answers to what those images are factually at the very end. Don't skip ahead and ruin it for yourself. Um, and then after that, there's one last exercise that you all can do via Zoom or in the classroom, um, done in pairs. It's a great way to come to know one another better. Um, and it's an exercise in finding one adjective about yourself and an anecdote that would illustrate that. So um, good luck. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you read Ariel's story. I really love her. Um, and as we're all social distancing, remember that one of the um, greatest ways to touch one another's soul is through stories and through writing. So good luck. Thank you so much for listening to me. Take care.